We will spend the majority of the winter term in molecular studying proteins. As a result, it is important to know about amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. Our study of amino acids will begin with the basic structure of these monomers. Although there are 20 different amino acids, they all share a few things in common. They all have a central carbon atom, known as the alpha carbon. There are four things joined to the alpha carbon. A carboxylic acid group, a lone hydrogen, an amine group, and an R group. The 20 amino acids differ based on their R groups as we'll see in the next slide. Many resources show the basic amino acid structure as the same way you see here. However, there is no way that the structure can actually appear as pictured. Instead, this is a more correct version of the structure, and by the end of this lesson you will understand why. You can see from this slide that all 20 amino acids have different R groups. Note that the simplest is glycine, with a single hydrogen atom as its R group. The amino acids here are separated into groups based on characteristics of their R groups. A number of them have R groups that are nonpolar, while others have polar R groups. Some are classified as acidic, while others are basic. Three of them, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and tyrosine, have ring structures as part of their R groups. The important takeaway is that every amino acid has its own distinct structure and properties because of its R group. An amino acid has different charge properties based on the pH of the solution it is in. pH dictates whether the amine and carboxyl groups in an amino acid will be protonated or deprotonated. The amine groups the amine group gets protonated and deprotonated, as you can see here. If the group has only two hydrogens, it is in its oxidized form and it has no charge, whereas if it has three hydrogens, it is in its reduced form and it has a charge of plus one. The carboxyl groups also gets protonated and deprotonated, as shown here. If the carboxyl group is in its reduced form, with the hydrogen on, it has a neutral charge, whereas in its oxidized form, with the hydrogen off, it has a charge of minus one. The amine and carboxyl groups are protonated and deprotonated based on their pKa values. If the pH of the solution that the amino acid is in is lower than the pK value, the group will be protonated. If the pH of the solution is higher than the pK value, the group will be deprotonated. The way I like to think about this is that if the pH is low, that means there are lots of hydrogens floating around. If there are lots of hydrogens floating around, the functional group will be protonated. The amine group has a pKa value of about 9, so at a pH of less than 9, the amine group will be protonated, and at a pH of more than 9, the amine group will be deprotonated. The carboxyl group has a pKa value of about 2, so at a pH of less than 2, the carboxyl group will be protonated, and at a pH of more than 2, the carboxyl group will be deprotonated. You should now be able to answer the question from the first slide about why an amino acid cannot exist in the form that was drawn first. Let's draw the structure of glycine, the simplest amino acid, at three different pHs to see how the amine and carboxyl groups look at these different pHs. Keep in mind that the pKa of the carboxyl group is 2.3 and the pKa of the amine group is 9.6 as determined by the magic sheets that are handed out in class. We need to think about whether the amine and carboxyl groups will be protonated or deprotonated at each of these pHs. Since the carboxyl group has a pKa of 2.3, at a pH of 1, the group should be protonated because the pH is less than the pK. The amine group 
has a pK of 9.6. So it should also be protonated because the pH is less than the pK. As a result, the structure should look like this, with both the amine and carboxyl groups protonated. At a pH of 6, the structure will change. The carboxyl group should be deprotonated because the pH is greater than the pK of that group, while the amine group should still be protonated because the pH is still less than the pK of the amine group. At a pH of 13, both the carboxyl and amine groups should be deprotonated because the pH is higher than both pK values. We can calculate the net charge on any one of these structures. At a pH of 1, glycine has a net charge of plus 1 because the protonated amine group has a charge of plus 1 and the protonated carboxyl group has no charge. At a pH of 6, glycine has a net charge of 0. And at a pH of 13, glycine has a net charge of minus 1. At a pH of 6, glycine is known as a zwitter ion, meaning it can act as an acid by donating a proton, or it can act as a base by accepting one. You may remember from chemistry that a substance that can act as an acid or a base is known as being amphibious. Because it has a net charge of 0, glycine is said to be at its isoelectric point, meaning that it would not move if it were exposed to an electric field. Take you will notice that there is a pi value given for each amino acid. Similarly to the idea of the pKa values, if the pH is below the pi, the amino acid will have a positive charge, and if the pH is above the pi, the amino acid will have a negative charge. An amino acid is neutral when the pH is at the pi. What if the amino acid has an ionizable R group, otherwise known as a side chain, as well? As you might expect, the protonation of the R group depends on the pH of the solution in the same way as the protonation of the carboxyl and amine groups do. Aspartic acid, or aspartate, is an amino acid that has an ionizable R group. The pK of its carboxyl group is 2.1, the pK of its amine group is 9.8, and the pK of its R group, or of its side chain, is 3.9. You should pause the video at this point and try to draw the structures of aspartate at these three pHs on your own. Once you draw the structures, see if you can figure out the net charge on each of the structures too. When you're done, I will walk you through it. At a pH of 1, the carboxyl, amine, and R groups would all be protonated because the pH is lower than the pKs of any of these groups. At a pH of 7, the carboxyl and R groups would be deprotonated because the pH is higher than the pKs of those groups, but the amine group would still be protonated as the pH is lower than the pK of that group. At a pH of 13, the carboxyl, amine, and R groups would all be deprotonated because the pH is higher than the pKs of any of those groups. At a pH of 1, the net charge is plus 1, as the protonated amine group has a charge of plus 1, and the protonated carboxyl and R groups have no charge. At a pH of 7, the net charge is minus 1, as the protonated amine group has a plus 1 charge, and the deprotonated carboxyl and R groups both have charges of minus 1. At a pH of 13, the net charge is minus 2, as the deprotonated amine group has no charge, and the deprotonated carboxyl and R groups both have charges of minus 1. Let's draw the structure of lysine at a pH of 9.0.
Keep in mind that the pK of the carboxyl group is 2.2, the pK of the amine group is 9.0, and the pK of the R group is 10.5. Right off the bat, we know that the carboxyl group will be deprotonated, as the pH is higher than the pK, and we know that the R group will be protonated, as the pH is lower than the pK. But what about the amine group? The pH is the same as the pK. In that case, half of the lysine molecules will have protonated amine groups, and half will have deprotonated amine groups. The charge on the half with the protonated amine groups is plus 1, while the charge on the half with deprotonated amine groups is 0. Therefore, the net charge of lysine at a pH of 7 is 1 half. Since amino acids have the ability to accept and donate protons, they can act as buffers. We can draw titration curves for them in the same way as we did for weak acids. Let's look at the titration curve for glycine that is shown here. At point 1, both the amine and carboxyl groups are protonated. As base is added, the OH- begins to deprotonate the carboxyl group. At point 2, when 0.5 equivalents of base have been added, the carboxyl groups on half of the glycine molecules will be deprotonated. At this point, when half of the carboxyl groups are protonated and half are deprotonated, the pH is equal to the pK for the carboxyl group. At point 3, after one equivalent of base has been added, the carboxyl groups on all of the glycine molecules will be deprotonated. As a result, the net charge on glycine at this point will be zero, and the glycine will be at its isoelectric point. At point four, after one and a half equivalents of base have been added, the amine groups on half of the glycine molecules will be deprotonated. At this point, when half of the amine groups are protonated and half are deprotonated, the pH is equal to the pK for that group. At point 5, after two equivalents of base have been added, the amine groups on all the glycine molecules will be deprotonated. Notice the shape of the titration curve as base is added. The pH is relatively level around the first pK value, then it increases rapidly, then it is relatively level around the second pK value. Glycine serves as a good buffer when the pH is within the ranges indicated by the pink and blue shaded areas. Let's look at the titration curve for glutamic acid, or glutamate. Glutamate has an ionizable R group, which makes it distinctly different from glycine, which does not. As a result, you can see that it takes three equivalents of base to completely deprotonate the ionizable groups of glutamate. Notice that the three pK values are reached when 0.5, 1.5, and 2.5 equivalents of base have been added. And notice also that the curve is relatively flat in three different regions, one at each of the pK values. Given that each point when the curve is flat indicates a good buffering zone, what general rule can you make about the number of ionizable groups and the number of buffering zones? In general, there is a buffering zone within one pH unit for each pK value of an amino acid.